going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Well, last week we looked at, we basically went through uh, and looked at many verses within the book of Romans explaining our need for Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. We went through what uh, most have acquired or have acknowledged to be the Romans road and I added a few into those as well. Uh, you couldn't spend much time in Romans without looking at some other stuff as well. But we really took a dive in and dug into why we needed Christ to come and to die on the cross for our sins. Uh, we discussed that each and every single one of us are a sinner from birth. Uh, that it's something that is a part of each and every one of us, that we all have sin and we all need somebody else to pay for that because we are unable to pay for our sins. We need Christ for that. So Christ came. He died on the cross for our sins, uh, that we could be forgiven, that He could take our place, and that we are secure in that salvation, that if we place our trust and faith if Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, and we repent of our sins and we follow Him, we can be saved. And that we're eternally secure in that promise. You know, the crucifixion and death of Christ is something that we talk about a lot. It's very important. Uh, you know, He had to die. In order for our sins to be paid for. There is no other way. We see in the Old Testament. It, uh, the, all the sacrifices that took place in the Old Testament. All of those were a picture of Christ. Those were all just pictures of the sacrifice that Christ was going to make. Those, sac those sacrifices that were made. They were not good enough. But they had to be. Uh, they, they were animals that were killed. And took a place symbolically of our of the Israelites' sins. But Christ actually died for real and took our sins as a perfect sacrifice. He lived a sinless life. He came as God in the flesh, lived a perfect sinless life, and died on the cross for our sins. I talked about it before, the very extreme things that he went through and the events leading up to the cross and being on the cross itself, the extreme things that he felt there. And I've talked about that the greatest, the most extreme pain that I believe he felt was the moment that our sins were placed upon him. Oh, when on the cross, it's when he took our place, our sins. Makes it important. Hebrews 2 and 14 tells us, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is, the devil. The other thing that takes place, that took place when Christ died on the cross for sins, is that he overcame death and he overcame Satan as well. As well, we see also fulfillment in it. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God, He told Adam and Eve, He says, And I will put enmity, or He told uh, Satan, He says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Uh, he tells us this is the death of Christ on the cross is even a fulfillment of this, of Satan being overcome, our sins being overcome. And oftentimes we place a very, very high importance on his death. I think sometimes we place too high of importance on the cross because it doesn't matter about the cross. It was who was on the cross that mattered. Uh, well, we need to be very mindful of who was on the cross, not the cross. But his death wasn't all that was needed. And the death and the things around it are very sad things that took place. Those that followed Christ before His resurrection, there were many that had kind of given up. But it didn't end with the death. 
because three days and three nights later, our Lord, Jesus Christ, rose up again. And the resurrection is just as important as the death. So this morning we're going to go through, we're going to look at some verses talking about the importance of the resurrection and how we need the resurrection. Y'all, many die. Many have died throughout the years. There were two others that were sacrificed on the cross with Christ and others that have been crucified as well. But only one ever rose up again of his own power. There are those in Scripture that were raised up again. They were raised up by the power of God. And those people died again later on. Lazarus is the one that we know of the most. And he died again later on. But Christ rose up again and has never died. And that is unique to him, especially since he did it of his own power. A few things we're going to see this morning, we're going to see that Christ has power over death. We're going to see that because of that, our work has a purpose, and also because of it, we have a future. Let's go ahead and read our text this morning. I invite you to stand with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. It says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God, that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Let's pray. Lord, I'm so thankful for this opportunity to be here this morning. I'm so thankful for each of those that are also here, ready to hear your word. I pray that you would open up the hearts of each and every single one of us that are here. If there are there any here today that do not know you as our personal Lord and Savior, if they would listen to your word and they would realize their need for you, they would accept you, Lord. I pray for those of us that have placed our trust and faith in you that we would listen to your word and we would learn from it, would be strengthened by it, and would be excited by it, Lord. And that after this time we can go and we can be ready to serve you our lives. I pray you would guide and direct me as I share your word. Please give me strength, wisdom, and remembrance of what I've studied that ultimately, above all else, it would all be for your honor, your glory, and your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, he addresses something that had been taking place here. We see that uh, it happens. He says uh, in verse 12, he says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? He's addressing a, a teaching that had taken place within the Corinthian church. 
uh, basically they were saying that there's not going to be a resurrection of the dead later on. It's not going to take place. If those are dead, it's just done. And so Paul is uh, addressing this to them and, and explaining here. He's going, going through these things, explaining to them, and kind of asking these questions as if what they were saying was actually true, as if there really is no resurrection of the dead, what that means for other things. Now later on, and we're going to see, he does clearly tell them there is a resurrection of the dead because of these other things being true as well. Uh, and so he, he kind of goes through this in this way of explaining these things to show to them that it does exist. And that it is as a result of Christ. And that there's other things that it affects for us as well. But the first thing that I want us to see here is that through Christ and His resurrection, it shows that He has power over death. So well, in this we see that Christ being raised from the dead and us being resurrected later on, they go hand in hand together. They're connected. You know, we talked about that in order for Christ, and we've mentioned this many times, but Christ was sinless. He never committed any sin. And this was needed in order for Him to be able to take our place. In order for Him to be able to take our sins, He had to be sinless. Because if He had committed any sins, if He had just committed one sin, He is no longer a perfect sacrifice that can take our place. You know, and this is the same, it's true for us. The reason we cannot save ourselves is because we have sin. We can't cover the sin, we can't take care of it because we have a problem with it. And we can't change it for anybody else. But Christ is able to save us, is able to take our place because He was sinless. We also see, though, that Christ is able to raise us from the dead. The resurrection is able to take place because Christ himself has power over death. Because Christ himself isn't dead. He is alive. You know, if Christ had not resurrected, if he had stayed dead, he would have been able, unable to do anything for us. He would have been unable to raise us up again. Turn over to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. John chapter 11 and verse 23. Eleven twenty three. it says, Jesus saith unto her, speaking uh, to Martha, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And in verse 27 it says, And she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. We see here, this is uh, the time, actually, uh, Martha is the brother, or not the brother, the sister of Lazarus. I, it, the, the Lazarus that later on it, you see Christ raises him up from the dead. And in this Jesus, he, he tells her, like, my brother shall rise again, uh, re referring to when Christ was going to raise him up. But also here we see that she talks about the resurrection that will take place in the last day, and that she believes that she will be with him again, that he is going to be raised up again later on in that time. And Christ tells her, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He tells her, I am the resurrection. I am the source of this resurrection. Uh, and he even says, you know, I am the life. And he says, and he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. 
believest thou this? He says, for those that have believed in me and trusted in me, that they will be brought up again. And those that did not die, so what's going to happen is there's those that have already died, and some that will die before that takes place, they will be risen up again. And there's also going to be those that will still be alive, that will be taken, and will be given the new body, an everlasting body as well. And some of us, Brother Jim included, would like to get out of here alive. I'm going to make it. <laughs> Either way, for those who have trusted in Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, whether they die or whether they make it out alive, are going to be resurrected to eternal life. Amen. Will be given a new body, a perfect body. You know, we talk about a lot about our bodies that we have now, our flesh being sinful. And our bodies having the desire to do sin. We talk about our heart being deceitful above all things as well. When we're given that new body, it is going to be a body that is purged of sin. For those that have trusted in Christ their personal Lord and Savior, their spirit has been cleansed. And their spirit desires to follow after God. But your physical body desires to follow after sin because it is corrupted. But in that resurrection, be given a perfect body, a body that will not die either. But Christ says, I am that resurrection. It is me that it is true. Let's well, notice here, though, that he talks about those that will be resurrected are those that believe in him. Christ also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. No man can come unto the Father except through me. Something I want you to understand and I want to make very clear here today. The things that we're going to talk about, and specifically the resurrection for us, does not happen without having place for trust and faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It will not happen. There's very serious consequences. It's not having confessed your sins, and repented of them, and accepted Christ in your heart. Your forgiveness. Your works, they mean nothing. Things you've done, things you think you've accomplished, it will do nothing in giving you these things. It is only through Christ. Eternal life is only available through Christ. And this is what makes it important for us. This is what makes the resurrection important, as I mentioned. In order for Christ to resurrect us, He has to be alive. He has to have also conquered death. You know, I cannot pay a debt to you to a bank whenever I owe that same bank a bill as well. Christ could not resurrect us from the dead if He was also conquered by death. But he has conquered death. He is alive. This is why back in 1 Corinthians in 15, Paul is asking him the question, if you're saying that there's no resurrection, then Christ could not be risen. And the same is true. If Christ is not risen, we cannot be resurrected. As we continue in this, we see that also Christ being risen has another effect on us. If you look at verse 14, it says, And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching, then is our preaching vain, and your faith also is vain. 
Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. The first thing, when we look at verse 14, He tells us that if Christ is not risen up from the dead, then everything that we stand for, everything that you believe, everything that you trusted in, is worthless. That's right. It's meaningless. You know, all other religions, there's, there's a lot of differences between following God, being a believer in God, and obeying Him, what we call Christianity, true Christianity. There are a lot of differences between true Christianity and all other religions in the world. But one of those is that those other religions, they either follow somebody that never existed, they follow somebody that's going to die, or they're following somebody that's already dead. You can look at those religions and it's always somebody that's dead or going to die. Christ is alive. The one that we follow, the one that we worship, he is alive. He is not dead. Amen. He is real. He is with us through his Holy Spirit. We're not alone. We're not following the things of a dead man. We're following the things of an alive man. And he's not just alive. He is prospering. He is king. And one day, when the resurrection happens, he's going to establish his kingdom. We're going to be in it. We're going to be a part of it. Those of us that have trusted in Christ. And he's going to continue forever. You know, I mentioned some religions follow somebody that's going to die. A person may be alive now, but they're going to die. Christ isn't going to die either. He's alive eternally. And that's why we're going to be able to be alive. But Paul tells him, he says, you know, if Christ didn't raise up, then all the messages that we've preached, all the things that we've given to you, everything we taught you, everything you believe in, everything you trust in, everything you hope in, and when we talk about hope in Scripture, we're talking about something that you can count on that's going to happen. He says, all of those things, worthless. Worthless. He even tells him as well, he says in 15, And yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise on. He says, and another thing, one thing, is it makes all of us that have taught you all of these things a bunch of liars. One of the things that we at Brookside believe, one of the things that I teach and believe to be one of the most important doctrines we have is the perfection and the consistency of Scripture, that there are no contradictions, there's nothing that is false in Scripture. Amen. And that is because either all of Scripture stands or none of it stands. And the same thing is what Paul is talking about here. He's saying if we've lied about Christ, then everything else that we've taught doesn't stand either. Everything fails. Everything falls apart. Scripture clearly tells us that Christ is alive today. Scripture also tells us in the Old Testament there are many prophecies that said Christ was going to rise up again. And the Messiah was going to be resurrected. It predicted it. Christ predicted it as well. We even saw in John where he says, I am the resurrection. He 
He said it many times that he was going to raise up again. So, if Christ didn't raise up again, then everything falls. Everything fails. Notice another thing he tells us here. Verse 17. He says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Mm -hmm. The cross was needed for Christ to take our sins, but the resurrection is needed to show that he overcame our sins. The sins were placed upon him on the cross, but he overcame those sins, and he overcame death. At the resurrection. You know, we saw last week that because of our sins, we deserve death. We've acquired death. Romans 6 and 23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. All that we can accomplish, all that we can earn without Christ by ourselves is death. When Adam and Eve first sinned, they experienced a, a spiritual death and began a physical death. Before they sinned, they were going to live for all eternity. But they sinned. <clears throat> if Christ wasn't able to raise and overcome our sins, then we'd still be stuck in them. Now look over in verse 56 of chapter 15. He says, verse 56, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A, a, the sting of death is sin. We have death because of sin. We, we have the sin has overcome us. But because Christ has resurrected, we have overcome it. We can overcome our sins. We can be brought out of those sins and we can have victory. But that is given to us because Christ I see now is that because of all of this, we've been talking about it, the resurrection. But because of Christ's resurrection, he does talk about it clearly for us. We do have a resurrection. He's been asking the question as if the resurrection doesn't exist and the effects that it has on it. But now he's going to tell us we do have a resurrection. If you look, Find one thing, other thing, though, is in verse 18 and 19, he says, Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. He says, if we don't have this resurrection, then everyone else that has come before us that has died, they're dead, gone, end. And he, he tells them that if this is true, if this is really true, he says in 19, if, this, if, this, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. He said, if the only thing we have is our relationship with Christ in this life, if all that's offered to us is this life in Christ, then of all the men, of all the people in the world, we are most miserable. We're most miserable. We're the most miserable people in all the earth. And just flashing forward, that's not true. We're not most miserable. Because of Christ. But, you know, 
the reason that this is me is because if all we have is this life in Christ, then that means we've wasted this life. Because everything that we do, the sacrifices we make, the things that we do, it's all about the future. We make our sacrifices here, we teach our lessons here, we look at the things here, because what really matters is eternity, not this life. We store up our treasures, not here on earth, but in heaven. Because what matters is eternity. There's all these things that we've sacrificed, especially Paul. I mean, Paul risks his life for the cause of Christ. And he'd been, at times, at one point he was left for dead because of Christ. Stephen gave up his life for Christ. John the Baptist gave up his life for Christ. The other apostles gave up their lives for Christ. Of all the apostles, it's believed to be John is the only one that wasn't martyred for serving Christ. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of suffering. Without Christ being resurrected, you've got a pretty horrible life. Look at verse 20, though. He says, But now is Christ risen from the dead? But Christ is risen from the dead. And you notice he continues to say, become the first fruits of them that slept. And he says, and those that were dead, they're the first ones to get to experience the blessings of him being resurrected. There are already those. Those that are already dead, they're not gone. They're with Christ in heaven. They're already experiencing the blessings of the next life. <clears throat> Paul, right now, is in heaven experiencing the blessings of the resurrection. Amen. Many of those that you know, those in your past, are experiencing the blessings of the resurrection. Shall all be made 
a lie. Through Adam, sin came into the world. Death came into the world. But through Christ, sin was conquered. Death was conquered. And we have eternal life. We have the blessings of God. His resurrection is made available to us for us to live forever. That even though we may die here physically, that is not the end. There is more. Something I want to point out to us is that each and every single one of us are going to die physically. The choice is yours whether you die spiritually as well. Whether you live with Christ for all eternity. Christ is alive. There are those of us that are going to be alive with Christ for all eternity. What affects is whether or not you take advantage of the resurrection. Christ is already resurrected. He's already done the work. We talked about last week that sins were already forgiven. The gift is already there for you, but you have to accept the gift. You have to receive the gift. The resurrection of Christ has already taken place. The benefits of it are already there. But you have to take Receive the blessing of it. Yes. Yes. Take of the fruits of Christ's resurrection. Look over in verse 52. Paul talks about the resurrection when it happens. When those that are dead will be raised up and those that are his children will be taken with him. Verse 52. He says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption... For corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that it's written, Death is swallowed up in victory. You know, you don't know exactly when death comes, and we don't know exactly when Christ is going to return, but one of them is going to happen. When it happens, it'll be too late to do anything else. But if you have done something about it, you will be in this group. That will be raised incorruptible. And if you are still alive, you'll be changed to be incorruptible. You'll put your, your mortal body will be made immortal. And then you will be able to say, death is swallowed up in victory. You will be with the winning crowd. And you'll be able to say, verse 55 says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Death will have no sting over you. The grave will have no victory over you. And then verse 57 he says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brethren, or my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. For the time being, for those of us that are here right now and have trusted in Christ, our personal Lord and Savior, we're not to just be suicidal, we're not to just be wandering around aimlessly, we're supposed to be standing strong. Well, we talked about that without the resurrection, our work, everything about us is vain. But it's not vain because Christ is alive. He is working. It is to us to continue working, to be steadfast, to be unmovable in the Lord. And to share the resurrection, to talk about the resurrection, to talk about the cross, to talk about people's need for the cross so that they can listen and they can accept the cross.
to abound in the work of the Lord. Abound in it. Don't just do it haphazard. Don't act like the work that you have is in vain. That it has no purpose. It has a purpose. Live as if Christ is alive. There are too many Christians that live as if Christ is dead. They don't do the things that they're supposed to be doing as a Christian. They aren't doing the work. They don't share the gospel. They use the world as an excuse not to do the work of the gospel. They use the excuse of the world to do whatever they please. And they don't care about it. They're living their lives as if Christ is dead and he's not dead. He's alive. Do something about it. One final thing. If you're sitting here today without Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, please place your trust and faith in Him. Please do. Please take advantage of the resurrection. It is a wondrous and glorious and wonderful thing. It's the greatest decision that you can make. It's the greatest thing for you. You may think, oh, it's not that great. You may think that you're losing something, but you are gaining everything. Amen. It is your sin that is telling you that you are going to lose something if you accept Him. It is your sin that tells you you don't need Him. You do. He paid too great of a price. He paid your debts. He sacrificed for you. Do not reject Him. Receive Him. Receive Him today. Christian, are you living your life as is Christ is alive? Maybe you do things with your life. Maybe you walk a certain way. Maybe you do certain things. That go against God. And we looked at this morning being the light of the world, salt of the earth. Be the light. Be the salt. Don't do things that cover up your light and drown out your soul. Follow the Lord. Proclaim that He is alive.